The WeDigs project is all about roundhouses in northwest Scotland. And I'm going to talk to you today about how the project <coughs> evolved and encompassed so many people as it came to fruition. In 2010, I'd undertaken an undergraduate dissertation for Aberdeen University, and I decided to make detailed recordings of hut circles, otherwise known as roundhouses or circular stone structures, all means the same thing, in Western Ross. The aim was to create a database for structural and sighting comparisons. The idea of hut circling seemed to catch on. Over the next two years, groups of enthusiasts roamed the hills of Western Ross and some parts of Skye. We recorded over 300 of these structures. <coughs> we explored some very rough moorland and also woodland and coastal sites. We recorded a lot of detailed observations and measurements. Now, local people always wanted to know when people had lived in these structures, but field survey could not tell us this. So, the Weed Digs excavation project seemed a natural progression. Some of us decided to try to organize funding for a limited number of small targeted excavations which could yield information about the building styles and the dates and the usage of these structures. We needed to be clear about our aims and methodology before we could apply anywhere for funding. Martin Wildbooth had supervised excavations around High Pasture Cave on Skye, similar to those we planned, and he gave us expert advice. Andy Heald of AOC Archaeology was also an enthusiastic advisor at every stage. Meticulous planning was needed, and every eventuality had to be thought through. The first task was to choose suitable sites. <coughs> In order to gain funding, the public and school children would have to be able to access the sites. Hence, it couldn't be used if it was far from the road. Now, six sites were chosen for excavation, spread between three areas of Western Ross. Two at Zapatabui, two near Alapool, and two at Gerlach. These are pictures of the sites before excavation. This one is at Loch Ra, near Akadabui, and you can see the yellow flags are outlining the detail of the stone circle. Sometimes you can't see all the stones, or very often, because of the vegetation on top. This one, again near Akadabui, is Akadahaird, and out in the distance you can see Akadahaird sands. Uh, the next one is at Roo. It's a smaller circle here, outlined by the blue flags, and we're about to plain table it before excavation. And then there's one at Strathain, Strathain, which is just up the valley from Roo. Roo is down here, so it's almost in sight distance, and there's a river coming up here. It's all very black because there was a muir burn which exposed the circle to start with, and this is the site mascot with a dirty nose because he rather likes black burnt oily heaven. <laughs> and then near Gerlock, we've got Acta Cairn 1, and it's a huge structure here, which is about 17 metres across. Um, on the outside, and it's got a wide entrance to the uh, southwest, that north southwest, <coughs> looking out on Loch Gairloch, and it's made of huge stones. And then after Cairn 2, which is about a kilometre away, it's much smaller. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, anyway, a week was assigned to each excavation. Uh, we had a base of experienced diggers as we got commitment from local enthusiasts in each of three areas, as well as from some NASAS members. So we had a viable project, and the detailed planning began. A preliminary project plan had to be submitted to Heritage Lottery, and we had an immediate setback. The plan was returned, with advice that funding would not be granted unless we explained in much greater detail what the project would provide for the community. We had a lot of encouragement and help from AOC, and we worked through the following. Now this slide is showing the management structure. We had to devise a management structure, and this ensured delegation. In fact, in practice, it didn't always ensure delegation. <laughs> <laughs> that was the general idea. We obtained Martin Wildgoose's agreement to be our archaeologist in charge, and we planned the methodology with him. Three small trenches for each site, one central, one through a wall, one to sample soil out with the structure. We approached schools to find out if they were interested in sending pupils to spend time at a dig, learning archaeological skills. Irene Brandt volunteered to take responsibility for organising the school children's learning. We found a website. There's uh, two pictures on the home page. After each dig, we aimed to send a report to the press and to update the website. 
We plan to produce informative leaflets. We plan to put on an exhibition in each area at the end of the project. We've got quotes for insurance cover. We worked out a timetable of digs over seven months, ensuring that key people were available. We asked a volunteer if he could make a video of the six digs. And this is a picture of uh, Bill Ritchie with his video camera about to video uh, school children from Wonderful High School on a nasty, cold, wet day, learning how to travel. Um, we worked out a detailed list of equipment that we already had and the costed equipment we needed to buy. We worked out an outline for prelim preliminary talks to interested adults in each area, as well as for the schools, to give them background knowledge. We called on or wrote to all the landowners and grazing clerks for the six sites, as we all on crop land, to obtain permission to bring the public onto their land and to dig. And that was quite a long process. We compiled a list of aims, and we compiled a budget covering every eventuality we could think of. And the last two items, aims and budget, were crucial, because once funding is granted, it is almost impossible to alter anything. And we had to do all this before we knew that we could obtain funding. Anyway, we overcame many glitches, and in the end, funding was granted. The Heritage Lottery gave weight in its decision to the gaining of local financial support. And we were grateful that Highland Council gave us a grant, as did Long Group Field Club, and two private sponsors. Then it was time to start. Press reports of funding success were sent to local and Highland newspapers. School talk dates were finalised to take place just before the relevant dig. And activities for the children were worked out in detail. Now here we've got Martin, the archaeologist, explaining the excavation and uh, showing the children the trench and what had been found so far. Uh, we were planning to teach them understanding about the soils. Here I am with a group of children in, from Gerlock Primary School, showing them the soil trench. And afterwards in school, one of them produced this drawing, showing the different layers of the soil that he had actually uh, seen and remembered. We taught them travelling with the possibility of a find. And here we've got a, a people from Gerlock High School holding an accretion of iron, which he's just found in the trench from Iron Pan. We taught them understanding maps, uh, GPS, what grid references were all about, and how the contours of the map showed you the landscape um, of uh, the area where we were. Now, each site had to be mapped accurately before the dig began. The initial recording of shape and dimensions during the original field study had been done using compass and tapes. A plain table was now used. The trench position were marked with pegs, and here uh, we've got volunteers marking out the wall trench at Aknehaird. Comes a meter inside the circle. These are the inner facing stones going outside the circle for about a meter as well, marked out with string. And uh, the plain table diagram, this is an example of one where we've got at Loch Ra, at Dewey, we've got a wall trench here, a meter across, a meter inside, a bit outside the wall here. And then inside, we have a one meter by one meter central trench, hoping to find half. And up here, out with the structure, we've got the soil trench. Before each dig began, we had to establish how many volunteers were likely to arrive. This was always a worry, because we only dug three trenches per site, and there was not a lot of trial building room. You can see everything a bit squashed up there. <laughs> I wanted everyone to feel that it had been worthwhile coming such a long way to help. Sometimes I asked Martin if we could open another trench, and the answer was usually a firm no. <laughs> However, once he said yes, Akta came too, and we opened the trench for school children in the nearby circular structure. Um, here on the left is Akta came <coughs> too. We saw that at the beginning of the slide presentation, it covered with heather. The heather's been stripped off, and you can see the shape of the structure. About 40 metres away is another structure, smaller, and that's where we let the children loose to begin with, but it yielded unexpected dating and finds. Uh, tea breaks and lunch breaks were absolutely essential. We always enjoyed a selection of cake. In fact, arranging for homemade cakes was another important task for each dig. One big chore for each dig was carting the equipment to the site. Lokra was easy because it was beside the road. One of the ways was Stratton. 
um, at, at, it was a very, very steep slope, and we had all-terrain vehicle help from the landowner, but we still had to carry it up the last bit. You can see how steep it is in that picture. And Aftercairn 2, that's the smaller Aftercairn one, was a long way from base. And here, where uh, the volunteers are uh, getting their equipment together from base, which is Jeremy Fenton's garage, and here we are, uh, coming up, uphill and down dale, carrying everything to the site. It was at least a kilometre of very rough terrain. Um, we had difficult time during the days with rain and cold winds and mud. This is at La Bra, and everybody looks very well wrapped up. Uh, and then we also had midges. And here we've got very well equipped people manfully struggling on in the trench. Martin kept us cheerfully going. We all felt the excitement when a half a possible stone tool appeared. We may have been the first to see these objects for at least 2,000 years. Some of us expressed their feelings in words and art. Jeremy Fenton composed a poem about roundhouses. Jenny Nichols wrote a short account of her experience on the dig. Rebecca Port and Gabby Rex are artists who produced watercolours and sketches. And here's one of uh, a sketch done at after Cairn by uh, Rebecca Port. These are all on the website. We have some interesting results so far, although results from the soil sampling are not yet available. I only have time to show you a very small uh, example, sample of evidence on occupation and structure, which we got from sections in the trenches. Now this is it out of the head. The first phase wall here, this is the outer facing and the inner facing of the first phase of occupation, filled in with rubble. This black line here is the early occupation layer. But later on, they did the second phase wall. This is now the uh, internal wall facing, filled up with rubble. This has no particular function anymore. And this is still the outside facing. The uh, occupation layer for this later phase is shown with this black line here. So we've got a huge amount of information from digging this one small trench through the wall. Also, at Abnehair, the soil trench showed evidence of at least one buried soil surface here. And we've got a Kubiena tin across here to take a soil sample. We haven't yet had the results, which may tell us a bit about what is in this layer. And um, at La Bra, one of the most exciting finds on our very first dig, this is the central one metre by one metre trench. We had three halves, one on top of the other. This is the earliest one, which is associated with a stone slab tank. <coughs> probably had water in it, probably hot stones from the fire tossed into there to cook the little fish that they've just caught from the lock, which is very near. Um, that's, that's just a possibility, but it probably would have been like that. And we didn't take the stack of halves to pieces. We've left them intact. Um, just perhaps for future archaeologists. It seemed a shame to take it to pieces. Um, we had small finds of stone tools at most of the sites, including an interesting quartz assemblage from Acta Cairn 3. And this shows a combination of techniques and the reduction of the quartz chunks to flakes and points. Nearly all the pieces were discards, but one tool was identified, a borer with a strong point. Um, we've been told in the report that the person who was doing this chipping away at the quartz was not very good at it. <laughs> that's quite a nice background story to it. Um, after Cairn 1, that's the big uh, structure, the big stone, 17 metres across, and Stratham, that's the one on the black, uh, heathery, black, burnt heather slope, had no occupation horizons, so they were probably not dwellings. What were they? The soil samples may help here, and it's possible that Stratham was a recessed platform, but used for what we don't know at the moment. Carbon dating gave us a lot of information about when there was activity within all the structures. Now I'm going to put up the dates. Now the archaeologists among you will not like that very much because I've approximated, but it makes it easier to understand. I've got the proper dates up on the, uh, my display table upstairs if you want to see. Now Apple to Bury, that log raft, this was the uh, latest date, the top. 400 BC, and Aknehaird was a kilometre away, and its date that we got from the half there was 390 BC, so they're at the same time. So 
So, not surprisingly, there were people living at both these sites at the same time. And similarly, at Rue, the half date was 500 BC, and at Strathen, on these, this platform where there wasn't an occupation there, we still got a piece of charcoal and we got a date for 500 BC there. So we've got people doing something at Strathen on this recessed platform at the same time as people are living in Rue, one and a half kilometres down the valley. And then at Ra, you've got an 800 year gap between the top and bottom halves. Now, they're in a stack, so it's quite probable, probable that there was quite a lot of continual occupation. But they may have gone away at some time and come back, we don't know. But uh, we need to get more dates from inside the stack to establish that. <coughs> and then uh, at Rue, we've got another date inside the wall of 270 AD, which AD, so that's nearly 800 years later than the half date. So perhaps people came back, or perhaps they lived there all the time, we don't know. And at after Cairn, it was all quite different. After Cairn 3 was Neolithic. 2,000 years earlier, they were in after Cairn 2, which was the one we mainly were going to excavate. <coughs> and after Cairn 1, we had dates of uh, Middle Iron Age for the central trench where there was an area of intense burning, but no occupation there. So we don't know what, the, what was happening here, but the intense burning didn't last for all that long. Post-excavation analysis is not yet completed. We've now got the final report to write, and some of us continue to roam the hills and record more roundhouses for the database. We began the project with questions about when and if people lived in these structures. In spite of digging only two small trenches inside each structure, we have a lot of answers to our original questions. We've involved about 60 volunteers and children from five schools. Open days and talks have evoked much interest from the public. Uh, we've had exhibitions in Gerlach, in Akutibui, in Alapur, and Eden Court Theatre in Burness. And these have all been successful. An example of this interest, on a play last week, I was sitting beside an Australian lady on holiday we're going to in Burness. She worked for the Australian National Trust. Somehow, and I think my friends might understand this, I began talking about roundhouses. <laughs> <laughs> she was fascinated. She went to see the Eden Court exhibition and she emailed me later to say how much she'd enjoyed it. We have produced an excellent booklet, which is for sale upstairs, produced by our group, non-profit making, any extra printing costs will go to the next carbon date. It's a guide to roundhouses in the Northwest Highlands. Now I'm sure the legacy of our project is the interest it's generated in our communities and beyond, and most importantly for the future in the school children of all ages who took part. In fact, school outreach has spread as far as Surrey. Here are pictures of a workshop I ran at an infant school there a few weeks ago. These are five-year-old children. I'm teaching them how to trowel, and they're finding quite nice things which I've planted. <laughs> Here's a, a, a tray of the things. And uh, then here I am explaining how a stone can be used as a tool. And then another group was put to make, construct a, a replica roundhouse. At the end of the session, half of the class of five-year-olds wanted to be archaeologists. <laughs> I'm going to end with a quote from one of the class. He was a gorgeous wee five-year-old boy. And he relished the trialing activity. He said, archaeology is about the wow of finding something that hasn't been found before. Is that not why we're all here? <laughs>